Today marks one year since Canada was defeated in its bid for uh, a seat on the UN Security Council. It was a close vote, but Canada has failed in its bid to secure a seat on the UN Security Council. Um, the Trudeau government's loss marked a rejection of its pro-Washington, militaristic, anti-Palestinian policies. And in the months preceding the vote, there were about a half dozen activists uh, all on this call who launched the hashtag NoUNSC for Canada campaign that sought to use this media moment to really criticize Canada's climate, nuclear uh, and mining policies, as well as its destructive role across the global south in countries like Bolivia, in Haiti, in Venezuela, and in Palestine. If we want a foreign policy that's based on peace, that's based on human rights and care for the planet, the only way forward is to organize because we know that we're stronger together. So we need to connect, uh, we need to amplify our collective efforts. And tonight we're really hoping to introduce you to some groups who share many of these priorities. It's very moving um, to see the extraordinary assembly of decades of powerful struggle and truth-telling and activism and organizing assembled here. The foreign policy space is absent in our national discussion most of the time. And yet there is incredible wisdom and skill and power on the foreign policy left in Canada. But I do feel that this is incredible timing, that we need a movement shouting international solidarity now like never before. It is, without exaggeration, a matter of survival. This work has never been more important. Mining Watch was created to bring forward the voices of communities and Indigenous peoples affected by mining to address their situations, but also to change the rules that privilege and perpetuate destructive and exploitative forms of development. Canada enthusiastically undertakes what we euphemistically call economic diplomacy, helping maintain and expand the pillage of vulnerable countries where trillions, yes, trillions of dollars in wealth are extracted globally. Meanwhile, the damage mining does to communities and ecosystems undermines the prospects for more sustainable development. We work with affected communities and civil society groups to expose these activities and their real life effects and to press for these discredited policies to be abandoned and make real contributions to the well-being and security of all peoples. We're pushing really hard to cancel Canada's arms trade with Saudi Arabia, fueling the war in Yemen, wherever we can. We're getting our bodies directly in front of these LEDs, these tanks that are headed to Saudi Arabia and the trains and trucks that carry them. As Canada becomes one of the world's top arms dealer and currently the second biggest weapons supplier to the whole Middle East. We're campaigning as part of the No Fighter Jets Coalition to cancel Canada's planned purchase of 88 new warplanes, which we know will be used as the last ones were to rain bombs in US and NATO-led wars. We're also organizing to stop Canada's planned purchase of its first ever armed drones, a planned purchase that very few people are even talking about yet. We've called for mobilizations. Um, Gaza, of course, is being bombed. It was bombed uh, the other week, as all of you know. Uh, we need to pressure the Canadian state to, uh, to uh, you know, put sanctions on Israel. This is, it's now the time for sanctions, uh, the time for education and raising awareness. You know, that's great, but we need to now move beyond uh, the raising awareness uh, strategy and move into more direct action, a direct action strategy, um, as well as increasing our lobbying efforts, like the good work that uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East and Independent Jewish Voice have been doing uh, for years and getting much better at uh, great to see. Plowshares has systematically tracked the Canadian arms trade since the 1970s. Whereas Canada acceded to the arms trade treaty in 2019, uh, the current government has exported more weapons to states accused of war crimes than any other Canadian government on public record. We continue to call for a cessation of arms exports to Saudi Arabia alongside other serial human rights abusers. Emerging military and security technologies are bringing forth new challenges to peace and civilian protection. In particular, the weaponization of autonomous systems. Plowshares is a proud member of the campaign to stop killer robots, supporting efforts for a ban on lethal autonomous weapon systems. We started working, uh, noticing, or, or rather, uh, uh, after what has already been talked about in terms of uh, Canada's role in buttressing the coup in Bolivia. But by that time, obviously, Canada had already been playing a leading role in trying to destabilize and overthrow the government in Venezuela through its leadership in the Lima Group. Uh, but, you know, we can talk about many other examples. Uh, the, the very seldom talked about sanctions placed on Nicaragua, 
uh, which will probably be accelerated uh, in the next coming uh, weeks and months, um, but also their support for repressive governments in Haiti, uh, recently in Colombia, uh, or as I can testify myself to in Chile, um, when I was there just as the demonstrations in 2019 were starting. Uh, we've been calling on the Canadian government to cancel its $36 million contract with Elbit Systems, Israel's largest military company, uh, weapons manufacturer, uh, which puts money directly into the Israeli infrastructure of occupation and war. Uh, we're also giving out these uh, free boycott Pillsbury sticky notes, uh, which you can apply to Pillsbury products in your own local grocery store. This is an action in support of a boycott of Pillsbury, uh, which has a factory in the illegal Israeli settlement of Adaro in East Jerusalem. Um, and so we're calling for a boycott until it closes this factory and complies with international law. Unfortunately, Canada's anti-Palestine voting record under Harper has almost entirely been maintained under Trudeau. The um, uh, democratically elected president of Haiti was overthrown in 2004. And after that, what happened is that Canada got increasingly involved, involved in financing prisons, uh, financing the repressive police, po police in Haiti, and in uh, financing fraudulent uh, elections. Canada is part of what is now known in Haiti as the core group. Uh, this is a, a sort of a, it's actually a neo-colonial force that uh, uh, makes decisions about the future of Haiti instead of the Haitians right now as we speak. Because we know that nonviolent solutions are the answer to lasting peace and that people and especially women do not need Canadian bombs raining down on them during a conflict. They need humanitarian support and protection of their human rights. So we conduct our work through three main pillars. The first is education and raising public awareness on these issues, such as at our annual peace camp, webinars and public protests. The second pillar is political advocacy, like the parliamentary petition against the 88 fighter jets and submissions to the government on foreign policy recommendations. And the third is collaboration with organizations like CFPI and many others I see today to advocate for peace. We're actually the first national Jewish organization in any country, as far as we're aware, to endorse the Palestinian-led call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And much of our work uh, focuses around these three pillars, which have already been discussed here today. Um, but another key part of our work is in resisting the IHRA definition, which Hamam mentioned earlier, particularly with our No IHRA campaign. The IHRA definition falsely equates supporting Palestinian human rights and criticizing Israel with anti-Semitism, a framework that we totally reject. Now, more and more Canadians are fed up with Canada's involvement in a string of military actions and foreign wars from Yugoslavia to Libya to Afghanistan and beyond. They've had enough of Canadian collusion with imperialist sponsored and organized uh, regime change campaigns and, and, and conspiracies uh, from, from Haiti and Honduras and to uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua, Bolivia, of course, and elsewhere. Um, and they have, uh, they're completely fed up with uh, ever growing arms budgets, uh, which continue to escalate at the expense of the vital needs of the Canadian people. We accompany social leaders, uh, indigenous land defenders, human rights defenders, uh, activists uh, in primarily in Colombia, Honduras, uh, uh, Mexico and, and Guatemala, where they are at um, great risk of, of, of death and harassment and criminalization and judicialization because of, because of their, uh, their activism and, and work. What we also do is political accompaniment, what we call uh, advocacy. Um, and it's really kind of where Canadian foreign policy and Canadian corporate violence intersects in, uh, in Latin America. Our origins coincided with 9-11 and the reactionary responses of Canada to quote-unquote terror that had a direct impact on our communities here and abroad. We became implicated in the anti-war movements here and we were also implicated in drawing attention to how 9-11 was utilized by governments in many parts of the world 
to unleash increased repression, as with the Gujarat genocide of Muslims of 2002, when Canada continued a business as usual relationship with India. The justice struggles we fund are mainly Indigenous communities seeking justice for war crimes of the past, digging up mass graves, etc., and for ongoing human rights violations, many of them related to actors in the international uh, economic order. And then the community defense struggles that we fund and support are mainly land, human rights, and environmental defense struggles of mainly Indigenous people, but also campus, non-Indigenous campesinos who are mainly um, suffering harms and violations and evictions due to one sector of the global economy or another. It could be the for export food production sectors, it could be mining and, and dams, it could be tourism and, and Mikilador sweatshop. Both groups are all volunteer grassroots organizations that work in solidarity with mining impacted communities. We do this by relationship building with members of these communities, by being a platform for these communities in Toronto, where much of the industry is based. Uh, we have a mining impacted solidarity fund, a community solidarity fund, which we can provide immediate support uh, to groups in need um, in, to help in their struggle for mining justice. And so this can be for buses, for a consulta, um, for funeral costs, unfortunately. Um, uh, a lot of times that kind of thing happens or just, you know, immediate needs. So despite the pretensions of Canada of being pro-diplomacy and peace, you know, this uh, basic human right of the 19th century of having embassies and talking, uh, is not being uh, done for the Iranians. Uh, the other situation that uh, ICC um, uh, works on is to condemn uh, any kind of sanctions from uh, Canada towards Iran. Canada has some forms of, uh, unfortunately, laws that uh, uh, brings any kind of exchange difficult uh, between the two countries. They, did, they mainly uh, do sanctions secondarily from the US. The discovery of nuclear fission was only made possible by Canadian uranium mined in the Northwest Territories. Nearly all the uranium used for the atom bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was refined in Port Hope, Ontario. Canadian uranium enabled the buildup of thousands of American and British nuclear weapons after World War II. If we could get Canadians to acknowledge the truth of this past nuclear history, the Canadian government would be pressured to be at the forefront of the global movement to eliminate the very nuclear weapons Canada helped to create. Then, from 1945 to 65, Canada fueled the nuclear arms race by selling enough uranium to the United States and the United Kingdom to make as much as 15,000 nuclear bombs. We have just published a booklet on the danger posed by the very existence of nuclear weapons, the role of Canada in their production, and the importance of mobilizing for their elimination. We started our fight more than 30 years ago against the Free Trade Agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We continue uh, against the Free Trade Agreement of the America. And in that process, we created this organization that works mainly on the American front. Uh, we work uh, on different countries, we do education, we do lobby. Today we are working uh, on sanctions uh, on Venezuela to remove it. We are working very hard for peace in Colombia for many, many years. We have been participating and uh, monitoring elections in Venezuela, in Honduras. So the Stop Ecoside campaign, which we are part of as Stop Ecoside Canada, is a global movement with just one pragmatic objective, and that is to establish a law of ecocide, which would recognize large scale and systematic destruction of nature as an international crime. And this could be done by adding a fifth crime to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So that crime would sit alongside genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the newest crime of aggression. Doing so would signal a moral and legal red line in terms of serious damage to the environment. And it would establish individual criminal responsibility, ultimately deterring actions that could lead to the destruction of ecosystems. Canada's government aided and abetted the occupation of East Timor with economic, diplomatic, and military support for that occupation. The thing that's remarkable about this story though is that 
even though the Canadian government and all the other gov major governments in the world said that uh, Timor independence was hopeless, a lost cause, and a fait accompli, uh, just like they say with Palestine today, um, East Timorese people continue to resist and they finally regained their independence in 2002. So it wasn't hopeless. Indonesia's former foreign minister said the, uh, here's a quote, the case of Timor-Leste or East Timor showed that Indonesia should never underestimate the power of non-governmental organizations when they unite behind a particular cause. Founded in 2002, the CNC is the umbrella organization linking and representing more than 20 Canada, Cuba, Friendship and Solidarity organizations ranging from Vancouver to Halifax. And millions of Canadians have traveled to Cuba and come away with a profound respect and admiration for the people of Cuba. Irrespective of their political or ideological positions, Canadians stand for the building of genuine friendship with the heroic island nation, relations based on mutual respect, equality and recognition of Cuba's right to self-determination and sovereignty. Consequently, Canada's relations with Cuba and any other country should and must be based on mutual respect and equality, not on outmoded colonialist and imperial ideas and practices. Long live international solidarity. Long live the international struggle for a better world. Tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the Trudeau government's foreign policy towards China, which is unjust, inhumane, servile, and not in Canada's best interests. Its kidnapping of Meng Wanzhou was a colossal mistake which cost Canadians dearly and undermined 50 years of good relations with China. Meng committed no crime in China and her company Huawei voluntarily contributed to the connectivity of Canada's northern indigenous peoples. The circumstances of her arrest in 2018 violated Canada's Charter of Rights and were done at the request of former U.S. President Trump, who expressly revealed just six days later that he intended to use Hmong as a bargaining chip in his trade war with China. There's a hunger that exists, it's real, uh, to push this country in the direction of a less harmful foreign policy. You know, on my end, I came to Uganda as a refugee, my family fled after soldiers came to kill my father at Makari University, where he was a lecturer when I was just a baby. And so I think about the urgency of all of this. And, that, and, and I think about from the perspective of Canadian responsibility, would this government have been less likely to make an attempt on my father's life if the Trudeau government, Canadian companies, hadn't supported the British backed coup that brought Idi Amin and the second Obote government to power and given, given the downward spiral that ensued? This work is urgent. Internationalism is more urgent than ever. Our, wor our world is becoming a smaller place. Our crises are overlapping. If we want a foreign policy based on peace, human rights, and care for the planet, the only way forward is to organize. So I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. International solidarity now. I know I'm going to become a sustainer. I want you all to be sustainers. If you can't personally, I get that. Your organization can, or some association union or somebody can. Join the network. The most important thing, as a lot of people have said, is to stay in touch and work together. But this little organization that could needs your help, all of our help, to be able to be able to do more in the next year and a half and what far beyond. So support the CFPI and support all of our work together by bringing the voices out and putting foreign policy on the public debate in Canada in all of its ugly facets that we've been hearing about. Canadians need to talk about colonialism at home and abroad. And this is how we do it.